Our next injury is one that nobody really sees very often in their career. And when you do, especially when you see its resolution, it's pretty dramatic. And that's your cardiac tamponade. What a cardiac tamponade is, when you have extra fluid, and more or less in the case of a trauma patient, blood starts to get into the pericardial sac. Now, it can do this in a number of ways, but what happens is that now, just like with the lungs, you have a visceral and a parietal layer. The visceral pericardium sits on top of the heart. The parietal pericardium is the lining of the inside of the pericardial sac. And right now, with all of us, we have a little bit of fluid in there for friction reduction, shock absorption, and so on and so forth. Because we hope that our heart keeps running 24-7, 365. And it allows for uh, that heart not to get irritated, among other things. Now, if your patient were to have an injury where they get a small leak in uh, maybe a coronary artery, maybe a portion of the myocardium tears and you get blood leakage from that, it'll start to collect in that space between the visceral and the parietal pericardium. Now, it could get in there and never cause a problem because there's not enough volume to make a, a big difference. On average, when we see a pericardial tamponade, you're looking somewhere between 150 and 200 uh, mLs of blood, give or take, before your patient becomes symptomatic. Now, when your patient uh, has that amount of volume build up into that space, what it will start to do is expand the pericardial sac. If their bleeding continues, now that pressure has got nowhere to go outward because the sac won't allow it. So now the pressure comes inward and basically starts squeezing the heart, just like putting something in a vise and tightening it up. What that eventually will start to do is compress the chambers within the heart and not allow that heart to actually expand and contract. The volume as a result that is allowed to enter as well as leave also diminishes. So what we have with the tamponade is a major, major perfusion problem in the end. Now, um, as that tamponade gets worse and worse, your patient becomes more and more symptomatic. Some of these signs appear a little bit earlier, some appear a little bit later, uh, but there is a distinct set of three signs that you would see with a cardiac tamponade if you were to pick up all three that nothing else in a chest injury will produce. And these three signs put together are something known as Beck's triad. The triad in and of itself obviously is three different things. So because of the blood collection in the pericardium, that's now squeezing that heart down, not allowing for sufficient output because the chambers can't expand and contract, blood can't come in, very little blood can go back out. The first thing that you'll start to see, it will be jugular vein distension. The same jugular vein distension that you see with a tension pneumothorax. I get asked the question all the time, between the two then, if it's a blunt chest injury, how do I tell the difference? Because if I see JVD, and obviously it's a perfusion problem with both a tension pneumothorax eventually and a cardiac tamponade, they both show signs and symptoms of shock, what's the difference? Well, the difference is, listen to the lung sounds. It's the easiest way. If you have a patient with blunt chest injury and they have jugular vein distension and they're showing signs and symptoms of shock, listen to the lungs. If you hear lung sounds, the likelihood is it's a cardiac tamponade causing that problem. If you hear diminished or see unequal chest rise or hear unequal breath sounds with jugular vein distension and shock-like symptoms, the likelihood is it's probably a tension pneumothorax. Now, there's nothing saying that a person couldn't have both at the same time, and that occasionally does happen. But that's the first part. Okay? Jugular vein distension is the first part of the triad. The second part of the triad is what I just mentioned, the shock-like signs and symptoms. More specifically, the patient starts becoming hypotensive for their age. And they become hypotensive because, as I mentioned, the heart ability to expand and contract is being compromised from all the pressure building up in that sac surrounding it. So when blood can't get in and blood can't get out, obviously your blood pressure is dependent on your cardiac output. And if that diminishes, which in this case it does, 
then that drops your blood pressure and eventually that starts to show up on your readings. Now, the third piece of this is something that's the hardest to detect. And it's the third piece that is normally in most assessments also neglected quite a bit. And I've been doing this now for 25 years. I'm still not sure why people don't do it, but they don't. And that's listen to heart sounds. The issue that most people have is that they don't know what normal heart sounds sound like. They don't understand the volume, the amplitude, or whatever, because we never listen to them. So if you don't know what normal is, it's very hard to detect and understand if it's actually muffled. But if you were to be able to do so, that would be the third part. And the muffled heart sounds occur because now that fluid surrounding the heart has become so much more thick, it just drowns out the sound because air doesn't travel through fluid very well. So Beck's triad, jugular vein distension, hypotension, okay, shock-like symptoms, and muffled heart tones. All three together, it's a dead-on for a tamponade. What do we do about it? Well, as I said, you can manage some other injuries that are associated with it, but if it's strictly just a tamponade, this is truly one of the recognize and run scenarios. Because what has to be done, and in some parts of the country, uh, there are some paramedics that are allowed to do so because, well, they live forever and a day from a hospital. And if they don't do it, the patient's going to die. Most uh, services that are in a rural, or I'm excuse me, a urban area or suburban area, you're close enough to a hospital that most medical directors don't want you to do what's called a pericardiocentesis. What that involves is taking a very long needle and placing it in the patient's chest right underneath their sternum and angling it up towards the heart. And what they try to do is pierce that space between the visceral and the parietal pericardium where all the extra volume is actually sitting. Now, once that physician figures out, or the paramedic figures out that they're in the right spot, there's a syringe that's hooked up to this needle and they just start pulling back the blood, basically draining the pericardial space. When they do that, if it's done soon enough, hopefully what happens is it takes that pressure off the heart, that ability, that constriction that's occurred on the heart is now relieved and the heart can start pumping them more effectively and hopefully their output increases their blood pressure comes back up and their perfusion improves. I've seen it done once. So when we were backing up into the ER, cause we had called ahead and the guy literally, he arrested like two minutes from the hospital. He'd been in an accident. It was a missed flight that we had. We had to transport this guy over an hour and we get into the hospital or we're getting down there and we called in because he went into cardiac arrest. The trauma surgeon literally is standing in the ambulance bay with his syringe with this huge needle sticking on it like this, like that guy in the in the painting, and just doing one of these things, telling us to back up. And he comes in the back of our truck and he looks at our monitor and I mean, just does a little dab of a uh, antiseptic on the on the chest and he popped that needle in there. And as soon as he started pulling it back, like I said, it wasn't even 30 seconds and this guy starts waking up. I mean, it was just freaking amazing. What we do otherwise, like I say, get him into a facility as fast as possible. The likelihood is they're probably going to go into cardiac arrest in a majority of the cases. Okay? Work these patients, buy them that time, do good compressions, do good ventilations, do good BLS, and that may buy them enough of a bridge time to get them to that definitive care, and they may still able, be able to survive.